Hello everyone, it's Lindsay, and today I'm back with another Bible journaling process and study for you guys as I continue to work through the Living Stones devotional kit from Open Journey. I will have everything linked down in the description box, including the Bibles that I use, the resources that I look at. All of those are always in the description box for you guys. I've been getting lots of questions about that. I put a lot of time and effort and work into the description box for you guys. So take advantage of um, that information that is down there. Uh, I did take a little bit of a break last week as I was recovering from the retreat that I went to in New Hampshire. Um, God blessed me with amazing health through the retreat, um, but there was a lot of travel. There was like a 22-hour travel day and then like a 25, 26-hour travel day for me coming home. Um, so I took last week just to rest and be down. That was not my intention, but you know, it happened and I'm glad I'm glad that I did it. So we're jumping back in um, where we had left off a couple weeks ago, uh, kind of doing the same process. I'm going to be sharing my study. Uh, and then going into the Bible journaling process. I will have timestamps linked down below for you guys. Um, today is going to be on Jacob's Ladder. This is section number five. And as I have been doing things a little bit differently, I've been including my study. I've been getting a lot of questions, both here on YouTube and on Instagram. Um, I knew it was coming, but it's kind of just brought out a lot, a lot of questions, um, a lot of requests, things like that. This study process may be new to some of you. This is what I have been doing behind the scenes for years. Maybe not, you know, writing it out in this way, um, but studying in this way is what I've been doing um, that you just didn't see here on camera. And so I've now started sharing that um, really to put the focus on the fact that that is the important part of Bible journaling is not the art, not all the pretty stuff, um, not even necessarily devotional content. It is studying God's word uh, in depth. And so I would highly encourage you to do that. Um, and that is why I'm sharing this is to be an encouragement. I am not a Bible teacher. I'm not a pastor because I'm a woman and I do not believe women should be pastors. That's a whole side trail. Uh, I have not been to Bible school or anything like that. I am taking the education of other scholars and theologians and, you know, men who have deeply studied the Bible uh, and I'm using their notes and their commentary to pull things together as I study uh, God's word. Of course, I'm starting with God's word. Uh, Ingrid in her devotional she does some of the work for you. She's already pulling together, you know, cross references or verses that go together um, in different areas of the Bible. I love how she does that. So that's already, you know, that part of the work is already done for you guys. But uh, a lot of people have asked to see my notes or have, you know, be able to print my notes or have them on the blog or, you know, something like that. I, that is not the intention behind this. The intention behind this is to share with you what my study was and encourage you to do your own study. Uh, we have the ability to flex those muscles, grow those muscles, and to do it. I know that um, for some women that may be new and uncomfortable, um, you may not know where to start, and that's why I try to give you resources. Again, those are linked down below for you guys. You're really not going to get good at it until you try it and exercise it and work at it. Uh, it does take some time, but it has been uh, so enriching to my life and my faith as I have walked through that process. Um, and so that's why I'm just kind of sharing with you and then giving you the resources for you to do it on your own. Don't take what I am saying. Now, most of these notes are not my words. There are, you know, some ideas in here that I sprinkle, but a lot of it, again, is coming from uh, men who have studied the word so much better than I ever could. Uh, and one of the main places that I pull that from is my John MacArthur study Bible. I have had this one linked underneath all of these videos. This is the study Bible that I prefer. I've done some research into study Bibles, um, and this is the one that I landed on. Um, my church is affiliated, you know, closely in relation with um, MacArthur's church and his seminary. Um, we're not a part of that church, but being a Baptist church, we um, get guest speakers from his church and things like that um, and his whole grouping at our church. So I'm very familiar with his teaching. Um, I feel like it's very sound teaching. I know there are a lot of different uh, study Bibles out there. If you're not quite sure where to start, go ask your pastor. That is where your first stop should be um, as far as like commentaries, study Bibles, resources. Go ask your pastor. He should have uh, that information for you and recommendations for you. If he does not, that may be a red flag. Uh, makes you question how he is studying, um, you know, and how aware of those things that he is. Um, and so, you know, be it's okay. You can approach your pastor and ask questions. If you're in a church where you can't approach your pastor and ask questions, that might be another red flag. I know this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, I just, you know, I've spent a lot of time 
here and in person with people hearing about uh, different churches and how they operate. And it's a little, it's a little concerning if a church is so big that you're not able to go and speak to the pastor that I, I think that that should be a concern. And so if you're looking for resources, have questions, go to him first, not some random chick on the internet. As much as I love you guys, as much as I love that you guys listen to what I share and, you know, kind of come alongside me, I am not your pastor. You should have a local pastor that you're going to. But so all that to say, get a good study Bible. Um, this includes all kinds of extra information, including study notes. Again, this is the one from MacArthur. So he has gone through and added notes to just about every verse through the Bible, um, like historical context, uh, cross references to other verses, uh, just various information that gives that kind of enlightens to the verse and expands on it a little bit more. Uh, just keep in mind that is man's word. No matter what study Bible that you grab, this is from man. This is from God. So you know, just kind of keep that in mind. I read it, I look at it, I study it, um, but you know, I don't take this as scripture. What's written down here. So when I sit down to study, uh, I look at the verse, I read the verse, read the verses around the verse. Uh, so today we're in Jacob's Ladder, Genesis 28, um, 11 will actually be 11 through about 21 or so, it looks like. So a big chunk of Genesis 28. Um, but then I also go to the front of the book. This is another nice feature about study Bibles. Um, the MacArthur one has kind of a glance at the book as a whole, giving you information about who wrote it, the background, the setting, who it's being written to, um, different themes that you can find in that book, even some uh, maybe interpretive challenges. So maybe some things, uh, verses or areas of the scripture that um, there's differing opinions about, and there isn't really a set, you know, this is factual uh, interpretation of this part of the Bible that he will share that. Um, and so this is a really good way to just kind of get an overview of the text, not just cherry picking a singular verse. We want to know the context. And I'm going to share a little bit of the context um, as we go in to today's study. Uh, another resource that I use is the Blue Letter Bible. Um, that is an app and a website. Um, and that is where you can get different commentary. Uh, I have done a video. I think it's my word study. I'll link it down below where I kind of show how to navigate the app, um, but you can't break it. So get in there and click on things, tap on things, open things, read things. There's so many different resources within the Blue Letter Bible, um, commentaries, word studies, cross references. I mean, you name it. There are even like charts and images and all kinds of things buried into that website that you can find. Um, and that is where I get a lot of my commentaries. Some of my favorites are David Guzik, Matthew Henry. Um, Matthew Henry usually will also include quotes from other theologians like Spurgeon um, and some of those. And so you just kind of navigate to the verse click on the verse, opens up toolbar, and then you can go to, you know, the commentary and you can see all the different commentaries. Uh, again, it's just one of those muscles you have to work out. It's, it's, can be a little intimidating at first. Um, and I haven't done like a thorough walkthrough. I may in the future, but I really want to encourage you guys to just explore and learn things on your own. That's how you learn. I don't want to just spoon feed you guys um, how to do a study um, that wouldn't be helpful to you. Um, it may give you the right answers. It may give you, you know, the checkoff boxes for a devotional study, but it isn't going to teach you how to do that on your own um, and do your own study. And so I would encourage you guys to, to explore that. So pulling together those commentaries um, and then just pulling it all together, writing it down, and then I can share it with you. The only reason I print this out is just so that I have it in front of me for these videos. Um, so I won't be offering this as a printable or anything like that. Again, I want you guys to be exercising those muscles and doing the study on your own. And I say that as like a loving parent would. I'm not reprimanding. I'm not, you know, complaining. I'm not anything like that. It's, it is an encouragement, ladies. We can study the word of God. You can do it. Um, just, just jump in there and take what I've pulled together or maybe given you guys some ideas and then explore it deeper. That is why I share this. So sharing a little bit of my study time 
for Jacob's Ladder. Um, again, another beautiful devotional entry from Ingrid. Uh, I just love her wealth of knowledge. She does have a little mini word study even uh, in here that'll be different than the word study that we do um, in this week's word study video. The word study will lo likely be on the word covenant. It may not be on Wednesday because I'm running a little late this week, but it will be up this this week, but she does have an additional one on the word ladder. So as we come to the story of Jacob's Ladder, um, this may be a story that you are familiar with. I know I was familiar with it. And initially when I read through it, I was like, well, I don't really know what I'm going to do with this. This isn't going to be a super deep study. Um, but as I read through it and looked at study notes and commentary, I got so much more out of it than I had just from reading the story. So kind of setting the scene here, uh, we have Jacob who is running from Esau. He has been cast out by his family because he stole the blessing that was intended for Esau. If you know the story, Jacob and Esau were twins. Uh, Jacob posed as Esau. Um, Esau is described as having, you know, furry arms. He was kind of the manlier of the two. Um, and so Jacob um, wore animal fur, went to his ailing father, Isaac, who, you know, was not able to see very well. Isaac thought that it was Esau that he was giving the blessing to when in fact it was Jacob. So Jacob stole Esau's blessing. So this is all kind of blown up, come, you know, to light. And so Jacob is running, um, has been cast out by his family and is running um, and so that is where we find him as we come to Genesis 28, 11 through 12. And Jacob is um, in Bethel. It was called Luce before, and then it will be renamed to Bethel. We'll kind of go over that. But this place, Bethel, is the same spot where the Lord had shown to Abraham all the land that he would give to him and his seed. Now, Abraham is Jacob's grandfather. That's Isaac is Jacob's father and Abraham's son is Isaac. So there is that kind of connection that you get uh, there. So here we come to Genesis 28, 11 through 12 says, uh, he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So you kind of read that and you're like, well, that's an interesting dream, but what does that mean? I know if I had read that without any commentary or notes, I don't know that I would be able to pull from that what that dream means. And so um, Matthew Henry says, note, God's time to visit his people with his comforts is when they are most destitute of other comforts and other comforters. When afflictions in the way of duty, as these were, do abound, then shall consolation so much the more abound. So God is giving Jacob this, this peaceful dream at a time when Jacob is, you know, uncertain. He's running from his family. Um, he, he doesn't have a whole lot with him. He's having to sleep, you know, with a rock as a pillow. Um, and so it is in this place of discomfort that God is coming to him and giving him a dream of comfort. Now, how is this a dream of comfort? Uh, John MacArthur says a graphic portrayal of the heavenly Lord's personal involvement in the affairs of earth. And here, especially as they related to divine covenant promises in Jacob's life, we'll see that in verses 13 through 15. Uh, this dream was to encourage the lonely traveler. God's own appointed angelic messengers ensured the carrying out of his will and his plans. So the angels um, ascending and descending that ladder is showing that God is intimately involved with the happenings on earth and he is taking care of it. He, you know, is sending these messengers to be very involved in the happenings on earth. It's not just God sitting up on his throne, distant from everything, um, kind of running his show, doing his thing, oblivious to what's going on in earth. He is very involved in the happenings here on earth. Spurgeon says, the God of Bethel is a God who does concern himself with the things of earth, not a God who shuts himself up in heaven, but God who hath a ladder fixed between heaven and earth. He is, he's, he's here with us. He is uh, intimately involved with the happenings here. This is a cross-reference in John 1 51. So I love when we see these connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So here we're reading about Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28. And then fast forward to John 1 51 says, and he said to him, this is Jesus, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. So slightly different than this dream that we're seeing in Genesis. In Genesis, we just see them on a ladder ascending and descending, these angels. Uh, and then here in John, Jesus is telling us that they are going to ascend and descend 
on the Son of Man. Now, if you have been doing this study along with us, Living Stones, you may have an idea of what that is alluding to as we talk about stones um, and this image that Inger gives us of, you know, this ladder possibly being these like stones tied together in this fashion here. Um, multiple times throughout this devotional, we have seen biblical evidence of Christ being referred to as a stone, cornerstone, um, you know, pillars and all these different things, all these different things involving stones and rocks um, that is alluding to Christ. So put it together, the latter is uh, Jesus, the son of man. And so God is able to be in communication with earth and those of us here through Christ. He is the ladder, right, between heaven and here. So he, Jesus is the access to heaven. He is the ladder. And uh, David Guzik says that Jesus is the way to heaven. He does not show us a way. He is the way. So this isn't a path to heaven. Jesus is the path, the way, the only way to heaven. Matthew Henry says that we have no way of getting to heaven but by this ladder. If we climb up any other way, we are thieves and robbers. Um, this made me think of the Tower of Babel. You know, they're building this tower. They're trying to build this tower up to heaven. Uh, and God is like, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, destroys it, scatters the people. You know, that's where we see the different languages come in um, to just introduce more confusion. Um, so they can't work together to do this again. But, you know, they were trying to make their own ladder to heaven. And that that's not, that's not it. God tells us that Jesus is the only way to heaven. So going forward to Genesis 28, 18 through 21. Uh, so Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my my God. And then skipping forward to Genesis 35, 14 through 15, Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken to him Bethel. So um, John Mark Arthur says that he's marking a particular site as of special religious significance by means of a stone pillar was a known practice. We saw that um, with the Israelites after they um, passed through the river, they set up a you know pillar of stones. Um, we see rock cairns and memorials. We've seen this multiple times as we've gone through this devotional. A libation offering, a change of place name, and a vow of allegiance to the Lord in exchange for promised protection and blessing completed Jacob's ceremonial consecration creation of Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. This is why he changed it to the name Bethel, house of God. Very interesting because as I was reading this and as I was reading the, the verse, I kept thinking like, Jacob is trying to make a deal with God. And I, John MacArthur didn't necessarily point that out in his notes, but Chuck Smith did. He says that Jacob was such a scheming man that even his vow to God was basically a bargain with God rather than a loving consecration. Now, through God's love and mercy, uh, he puts up with Jacob's uh, schemingness um, and, you know, continues to be patient with him. But, you know, this is not how our relationship with God should be. It's not a transactional. It's not, if you do this for me, God, I'm going to do this for you. That That's not how it should be. We should be responding to his love and grace um, and salvation that is offered to us um, with a spirit of thankfulness. Um, and all of our actions should be in response to what has been done, not this transactional uh, situation. But I mean, it's no surprise from Jacob. We saw that he was scheming all the way back um, with his brother and, you know, stealing the blessing from his father. Um, that was just Jacob's, uh, you know, it is, it is who he is. And they, we, he is just continuing to live up to um, what he's already been doing. Um, but through promises, and we saw those um, in verses 13 through 15, and we'll actually go to those because I didn't have them written down. Um, God tells Abraham that, you know, he's going to have many, 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 many um, 
ch children, as in, you know, a lineage very large coming after Abraham. Um, it is from Abraham, Abraham's line that Jesus will come. Um, and so this has already been set into motion. And so despite Jacob's um, personality traits that aren't so great, God still is going to use him. And so in verses uh, 13 through 15 of Genesis 28 says, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to the land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So God is reminding him of his promises to him. Um, and he is a faithful God that maintains those promises despite Jacob's scheming <laughs> that he's doing here. Um, very interesting little note. Uh, later, Bethel, which means the house of God, becomes Bethaven, a house of vanity, when Jeroboam set up one of his golden calves there. So later on, and you can read about this in 1 Kings 11 through 14, uh, King Jeroboam, there's a couple of kings and they're kind of wrestling over the kingdoms, but he gets full of himself, sets up these golden calves as false idols. And one of those calves is set up in this place of Bethel, which is then later called Bethaven, a house of vanity. So very interesting there um, to see, you know, once again, man coming and just tainting things. I mean, we, we are just our sinfulness and the flesh of, you know, of who we are just is not does not compare to God and who he is and his faithfulness and his holiness. Um, and so he just keeps having to come in and fix things um, and ultimately sends Jesus to be the ultimate fixer of all things, right? That's how, where all of our sins are forgiven through him. Um, and we're able to have a relationship with God and an eternity with him because Jesus came down as the ultimate fixer of our things that we mess up. So lots of good deep dives that you can go down into just off of these few notes. Again, I would encourage you to go in, dig deeper. Um, if you have a regular Bible, typically that will say like cross references or CF. Um, so you would look at your verse and there might be cross references to other areas of the Bible, like we see here between Genesis 28, 11 through 12 and John 1 through uh, 151. Though that's a cross reference. That's where another area of the Bible is referring either back to this or is referring about the same thing in those verses. And so that's a great way to expand your study, even just um, kind of surface level starting out, just start looking at cross references and looking at the ties between different areas of the Bible. Like we see here, um, you know, he has this dream of the ladder. And then later on, Christ says that the angels are ascending and descending on the son of man. Jesus is that ladder. And so that is going to be kind of the focus of my page that I'm going to do today. Um, so as we move into that, I will be journaling in my uh, interleaved Bible and we'll be doing some similar things that you guys have been seeing as I work through this. Of course, some dyed paper. This has just been such a simple, easy way to do a background. So I have a little bit of that, um, but I had some hymnal. Now, for those of you who are watching my stories on Instagram, I had taken this with me to the retreat and in Nashville during my layover, they left my bags, I'm assuming out on the tarmac during a storm. Everything was just soaking wet. There was puddles of water in all of my bags. It was ridiculous. So this definitely got some water damage, but that's okay because I'm going to be you know, grunging it up and giving it some more damage. So this was not a total loss. It just gives it some, some texture already. So I went through and pulled this hymn, the church is one foundation. Um, you know, Christ is the foundation as we've been studying through, um, this devotional that has been kind of the reoccurring theme is, you know, Christ is the stone, Christ is the cornerstone, the foundation of the church is Christ. Um, and so I wanted to include that in here. And then I had this piece uh, from the devotional kit. It was the uh, piece that fits in a traveler's notebook, but I'm actually going to use this as an ephemera piece. I've already started to kind of tear it, but I'll show you how I did that little trick for that. Um, and then I pulled together some other pieces. So I actually pulled some um, pieces from the Follow Me devotional. That was the Lent study. Uh, I really love the graphics that were in there. So I pulled a couple pieces from that. I have just a scrap piece of 
cardstock, craft cardstock uh, that we will be incorporating into this, but it should be fairly simple, though I do have some stamps to kind of, you know, elaborate on the background a little bit uh, and some things like that. So let me go ahead, put you guys on fast forward, and we'll put together this entry for Genesis chapter 28. All right, so starting with some multimedia matte gel from Ranger, once again, pretty much the same thing I've been doing <laughs> for this whole series of processes, and then just gluing down one of those dyed papers. I do keep getting questions about those. I link the video down below. It's just a shorts video, and then I also have it as a reels over on Instagram. I try to always link the videos that pertain to this current video in the description box as well. I really try to give you guys all the things you need. <laughs> so I glued that down with that matte gel. And then now I'm moving on to this hymnal piece. And I wanted to show you a different way to kind of age or distress things. I usually use distress inks or spray stains, um, the re-inkers, but here I'm going to use some watercolor. So the trick with this is you want to really water down the color. So I'm adding a lot of water, not a lot of pigment. And then I'm also spraying the paper before I go to the paper with the color. And I'm using a water brush. So that has water continuously flowing through it. Um, this technique is not perfect. You'll see you can still see some brush marks, but it is a quick and easy way to you know, kind of grunge up, get some color on a piece like this. Um, then I'm also pulling in um, kind of off camera here, some colors from Prima Tech. So that first brown color is a, um, oh, art philosophy color, but then this reddish color that's got some grays in it. And then the blue I'm going to use are from the Daniel Smith Prima Tech line. There is a small box set of them. I will link that down below. That is what I have. So I'm using the red from that set and the blue from that set. They are just such beautiful colors. They have some granulation. They just paired really well with the colors in this kit. And then I pulled out this stamp set from the, I think this is from the Come With Me devotional kit. It has this like cup ring stamp and I'm just painting the watercolor on the stamp and then stamping with it. So another way to kind of add some aging, use your watercolors. I don't use my watercolors enough. So I was just trying to show you some different ways to do that. You can see the watercolors do lighten as they dry. So you can build up layers if you need to, um, but I, I like it as is. And then I crumpled it up, made it all messy looking. And then I am going to come in and add a little bit of distress ink just to kind of liven it up just a little bit more, but this step is not needed. I'm using some tea dye distress ink. I typically like to use the regular distress inks for inking edges of things. Um, the distress oxides are really great for doing like blended backgrounds because they're really smooth, but I like the intensity of color that you get with the original distress inks. So I blended that around the edges and then now moving on to this piece here. And so to get controlled tearing, like I have on the right hand side, I'm just taking some water. I'm, I'm using a water brush that has water flowing out of it as well, but you could use a regular paintbrush and I am just painting a waterline around the image where I want it to tear. And the paper will mostly stick to just tearing where it is wet. So that is a way to have a nice controlled line. I don't have to worry about it, you know, going crazy and ripping my image. Um, you do still want to go pretty slow and you can see I'm, I'm grabbing a hold of the paper on either edge of that wet line, pretty close to that wet line, um, just so it's even more controlled, but then that gives you that yummy texture, um, without having to like fussy cut it, you know, fussy cutting gives you that very defined edge. This gives you a much rougher, more organic edge, um, to, when tearing it that way. So I'm kind of staging things to see. I'm really struggling with the colors on this particular page and I struggle all the way to the end and it's still not 100% happy. I don't know. Some days everything goes well color wise and other days it doesn't. So I'm inking up the edges of this piece with some old, uh, old paper distress ink which has a greenish tinge to it. I think what I'm struggling with is that yellow that pulled out of the dyed paper. I really should have reached for yellow inks. Um, instead, I'm trying to use some neutrals from the Distress inks, but I'm not grabbing the right color. So I went in with old paper and then I went over it with pumice stone. Uh, and then 
I'm gonna pull in a little bit more of that pumice stone by adding some stamping to this background. Now you've seen in past videos, I seal the top of this paper with clear gesso. If I'm gonna be using a lot of inks and sprays and things like that, but I did not seal it this time because I wasn't gonna be doing a lot of sprays or crazy mixed media techniques. The layer of matte gel medium underneath this dyed paper is enough to protect uh, from this stamping. So I'm just using a couple different texture stamps from Open Journey and stamping in that pumice stone distress ink to pull in the pumice stone that I had inked up the edge of that uh, stone piece with. And so there is a lot of white on that ephemera piece and so I'm going to pull in some white in some other areas. So I've grabbed the picket fence distress paint and I'm going to stamp with that. Now you'd want to be very careful because distress paint is permanent once it's dry. Um, so when you're stamping with it, you need to clean your stamps very well and right away before the paint dries. Um, but I'm not too worried. My stamps are meant to be used. So I'm using a couple of the different ones from the new release from Open Journey that has these crosses. I am obsessed. I think I've used these on just about every page with this devotional. Uh, at the retreat, we were like, all working with these stamps as well. Like they are just, they're good ones. They are really, really good ones. So just stamping that in a few different places in distress paint. The distress paint stays pretty white. It's not going to pull too much of the color that's underneath it and it's opaque. And so that's why I went with that versus like a white ink. Um, white inks, I've struggled to find a good white ink that I like. I'm also going to splatter a little bit of that white paint around the background. Um, you don't need to do all of this. Those dyed papers really give you a great textured base on their own, but I wanted to pull in some of those other colors that I was using in different pieces there. So I'll start assembling. I'm just using that matte gel medium as a glue to glue down this hymnal page um, and just kind of getting it to fit exactly where I want. This, this cluster was pretty tight in that I didn't want to cover up the crosses I had stamped. I'm not wanting to cover up the title of the hymnal when I put that stone ephemera piece down. So I'm kind of staging everything where it needs to go and then lifting up edges and adding glue uh, down. That way I'm really controlled where I'm putting these pieces. I was a little, little extra fussy with this one. Just kind of wrinkling up some of those edges and then I will cut off any excess. And you can see on the back there, nothing's bled through from the stamping that I did because it was adhered with the matte gel medium, which acts as a glue and a page prep. So everything's kind of sealed in there. So I know this piece is gonna go there. I think when I struggled the most with this was this linear line of these stones. I don't do a lot of like straight lines in my creating. I'm much more like, askew and odd numbers and wonkiness. So that straight line was just kind of, kind of throwing me. I pulled out this cobblestone, uh, number two embossing folder from Sizzix and just embossed that piece of craft cardstock. It has so much beautiful texture. I do not know why I hadn't thought of this before, uh, cause it goes so well with this kit. And so I'm just going to kind of tear and roughen up the edges again. So everything is kind of cohesive not wanting too many straight edges because I'm working with that straight line of stones. That's just <laughs> it's throwing me for a loop there. The paper is a little bit damp when I'm tearing it right now. And so it makes it easier to control how I'm tearing it. And then I'm just going to take some white Versamagic ink and rub that over the top to really bring out the texture of those stones and bring in a little bit more white. And you can see this is a pretty good white pigment ink, but it's, it's not super, super white. So if you know of a really, really good, very opaque pigmented white ink, please leave it in the comments down below for me. I've been on the hunt forever. <laughs> That's kind of coming off gray uh, on that piece, which is fine. So I'm going to ink up this little hallelujah piece. Again, this is from the Come With Me devotional kit. I'm um, doing it the same way I did those stones with old paper and then pumice stone. Um, that way those two kind of match and bringing those colors in somewhere else. There is a little bit of yellow on this die cut, which does kind of pull in the yellow from that top left-hand corner of that background paper. And then now I'm going to stamp on this book 
Um, this is an ephemera piece from the Come With Me devotional kit. I have this set of alphas from Felicity Jane, and they're all lowercase, but I don't want Jesus to be lowercase. So I actually just avoided inking up the little dot on the J and set the J up on the line with the other letters, and it made it uppercase. So try try that with some of your alphabets. If you have lowercase alphabets, you might be able to fudge the J a little to make it an uppercase um, if you want to do that. And I'm doing the same echo stamping technique that I saw Ingrid do in one of her videos where you kind of stamp and then stamp off second and third generations and it kind of creates this like halo effect that fills in your stamping. I really love the look of that. Uh, the words is and the, those were using some block stamps that I just found at Michael's in the like cheapy, it's not the dollar spot because nothing in there is a dollar, but um, they're just kind of the upfront as you're going to the registers. There's all of that inexpensive kind of stuff that we pass by because it's not really good quality. <laughs> the stamps came um, from that section there. So now I can adhere everything down. Those florals are from some past uh, open journey kits as well. I just throw everything in a container together when I'm done with the kit um, and then they just kind of mix and match. There is a stamp set with those florals as well. I'll link that down below. You could create your own ephemera uh, that way if you wanted to. So I'm just going to go ahead and highlight this entire section in Genesis 28 that addresses Jacob's dream. Um, but then I also want to reference that passage in John 1 51. So I'm pulling out the little ephemera pack from the Living Stones devotional kit that has all of these washi strips. And I'm going to just write out John 1 51, um, tear that apart. So it looks like a little torn piece of tape and then add that to the bottom there, just so I know that I have that uh, reference point there. So there's a look at the finished page. On the back here, you can see no bleed through for my stamping or anything like that. I will have everything linked down below for you guys. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to leave those down below for me. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed. And until next time, thank you so much. Bye-bye.